Imagine, 4 billion years ago, somewhere in our galaxy, there was a star similar to our Sun. It had a planet similar to Earth, and there was carbon life very similar to ours. Not just life, a civilization. Let's imagine their science was also similar to ours. They studied the galaxy looking for planets around other stars, planets suitable for their life. One time they saw our young sun and found several planets. So the first, the second, the third planet, probably uninhabitable. They would come to this conclusion if our modern models of solar evolution are correct. According to those models, the young sun was 30% fainter than it is today. It's hard not to mention the so-called habitable zone when talking about the potential habitability of exoplanets. A region around the star where a planet could have liquid water on its surface, which is one of the key ingredients for life as we know it. How wide and how far from a star this region is depends on the star's luminosity. So over 4 billion years ago, the sun's luminosity was only 70% of what it is today. If our atmosphere's chemical composition had been similar to the modern one, the whole planet could have been frozen. Now we can make a couple of conclusions. First, you can't know for sure what the conditions on a planet are based only on its distance from a star. But also there is a faint young sun paradox. On the one hand, based on solar evolution models, the Earth back then had to be a frozen desert. On the other hand, there is a lot of evidence for liquid water on the surface from those times, and even life supposedly emerged somewhere in that period. And that's a big problem, and it hasn't got a complete solution. But of course, it's not to say there aren't any ideas. And that's what we are talking about today. My name is Andre, and this is Cosmos Elementary. But hold on a second. How do you even know that the sun used to be 30% fainter? For that, we need to know how the sun evolves. It changes during its life cycle, even on a main sequence. We don't have a time machine to go 4 billion years back to see what the young sun was like. What we can do is study other stars similar to the sun. If a star has a similar mass, luminosity, composition and so on, it should evolve very similarly to our sun. So by observing such stars of different age, we can learn a lot about how our sun evolves as well. And of course, scientists use theoretical models that take into account laws of physics and observational data that we can get today. Obviously, those models are not without some assumptions, but still they work pretty well, reproducing actual sun's behavior. So why does it change with time? As any other main sequence star, the Sun converts hydrogen into helium via thermonuclear reactions in its core. That's how it produces energy. The most important is proton-proton chain, and there is also a CNO cycle. The amount of hydrogen is obviously not unlimited. That's why stars are not eternal. Gradual increase of luminosity is a direct consequence of thermonuclear reactions. Our Sun formed in a molecular cloud. Due to some instability, a fragment of that cloud began collapsing, creating a denser object, which eventually became a star. It stopped collapsing further because thermonuclear reactions started. And gravity was counterbalanced by outward pressure. In other words, the star achieved hydrostatic equilibrium. While there is enough fuel, gravity and pressure balance each other out. A change in one leads to a change in the other. This is how the star isn't collapsing or not falling apart. So what does it have to do with the luminosity? It may sound counterintuitive, but the less fuel is left, the brighter the star gets. As more helium is created, it sinks down to the center and the density of a core increases. To sustain the pressure and keep the balance, the core has to contract, thus it heats up. It increases the rate of thermonuclear reactions, that leads to more energy being produced and luminosity increases. It is an inevitable result of Newtonian physics and dependence of thermonuclear reactions on density, temperature and composition. So the Sun used to be 30% fainter. This graph shows how luminosity changed over time according to some models. By the way, it's not only luminosity that changes. The Sun also gets bigger. Initially its radius was smaller than it is today. This is why we think that the Sun was dimmer and the Earth could have been much colder. Now to the second part of the problem. That, in spite of all of what I've just said, apparently early Earth wasn't that cold. But how do we know it? Sure, the Sun might have been way dimmer when the Earth formed. 
but still, our planet didn't cool instantly after formation. Also, during the first tens of millions of years, the Mars-sized body probably collided with the Earth, and that event led to the Moon formation. Needless to say, that event warmed the Earth up. And yet there is evidence that water existed on Earth as early as 4.4 billion years ago. It's based on the studies of zircon minerals found in the most ancient samples. Isotopes in those minerals can be evidence for formation in the presence of water. But even if there was liquid water on the surface that early, in spite of the weaker sun, still the conditions back then probably weren't very good. Magma on the surface, strong greenhouse effect and so on. That's why in some papers on the faint young sun paradox, Hadean can be excluded and they focus on the later period of 4, 3.8 billion years ago after the heavy late bombardment was over. Anyway, even 3.8 billion years ago, the sun was still too dim. With some assumptions, it could have been too dim even up to 2 billion years ago. And yet there is evidence for the liquid water on the surface during the time when Earth was no longer covered with magma and the atmosphere was different, but the sun was still faint. The evidence dates back to 3.8 billion years ago. Those are various sediments. Pillow lavas, structures in water when lava cools down, ripple marks that form because of water waves, mud cracks. And not only water, the life itself could have existed very early in the history of Earth. Some of the oldest fossils point to life existing on Earth 3.5 billion years ago, and some findings are even interpreted as evidence for possible microorganisms 3.8 or even more than 4 billion years ago. So in spite of the sun probably being too faint, early Earth wasn't just going to completely freeze, and it might have had life early on. We also shouldn't forget Mars, which is even farther from the Sun, and yet it could have had liquid water on the surface in the same time period. And now, what are the possible solutions to this apparent paradox? Firstly, we can't make definitive conclusions about conditions on a planet based solely on the distance to a star. A huge factor is an atmosphere. But it is one thing if the star is faint. But what if there is no star at all. I'm talking about so-called rogue planets, which could have been kicked out from planetary systems soon after formation, and now they are orbiting the galactic center on their own. There are some hypotheses that under certain circumstances, even they can have liquid water and be habitable. It could be possible due to a thick atmosphere of a certain composition and a strong greenhouse effect, which won't let heat escape a planet. That's a study on that, for instance. And that is a 1972 article written by Carl Sagan and George Mullen. This article drew attention to the problem in the first place. They already mentioned the greenhouse effect as one of the possible solutions. So an atmosphere can be transparent for certain wavelengths of solar radiation. Part of it is reflected and part of it is absorbed. That warms the surface up and then greenhouse gases absorb and re-emit thermal radiation in every direction. And part of it is directed towards Earth and it warms the atmosphere up. There are various greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, water vapor and others. Sagan and Mullen proposed ammonia which can be a strong greenhouse gas. But the problem with ammonia is that it can be quickly destroyed by solar radiation. Another gas that might have taken part in warming Earth up is methane. It gets destroyed way slower. And finally, it's CO2 or carbon dioxide. A major benefit is that it can occur in our atmosphere without life being involved. Early in the history, Earth could have had way more CO2 than it does now because of volcanoes, asteroid impacts, especially large ones. They could have melted the surface and released large amounts of CO2 and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. There are definitely some uncertainties, but overall, a strong greenhouse effect is one of the most obvious and plausible solutions for the faint young sun paradox. Speaking about the atmosphere, we shouldn't forget clouds. Ideally, they should be taken into account in climate models. The problem is that they can have both warming and cooling effects depending on the type of clouds. High altitude clouds may increase greenhouse effects, warm the atmosphere up and as a result be a factoring solving paradox. On the other hand, lower altitude clouds may have an opposite effect, increasing albedo. Oh, albedo. You've probably noticed that on a sunny summer day, generally darker objects get hotter than the light-colored ones. 
it works on a planetary scale as well. There are different types of albedo, but in this case, it's basically a measurement of how much light is reflected off the surface of a planet. This parameter has a significant influence on a planet's climate. If we take a look at our moon, its reflective properties don't change very much over time. No atmosphere, no drastic changes on the surface. But here on Earth, water gets frozen, the ground gets covered with snow, and of course, cloud layers are constantly changing. Ancient Earth's albedo could have been influenced by the area of dry land at that time. Overall, lower albedo billions of years ago could have also played at least some part in warming the planet up. But okay, so we suppose that the young sun was dimmer. But we also know that the luminosity of a star is directly related to its mass. The more massive the star, the higher luminosity. So perhaps it could have been warmer on Earth because the sun used to be more massive and then it lost some mass. This is actually one of the proposed solutions to the paradox. But you might ask, where did the mass go? Some rogue black hole just happened to fly through the solar system and casually stole some of the sun's mass? Or some alien civilization used to use our star to fuel their spaceships? But in all seriousness, the sun actually does gradually lose mass, but in a more boring way. For instance, in thermonuclear reactions while making helium out of hydrogen. Helium might be staying in the sun, but some energy generated in that process eventually leaves the star. If it didn't, we wouldn't be sitting here. Energy and mass are equivalent, so very slowly the sun actually loses mass. Also, there is solar wind, a constant stream of charged particles originating in the solar atmosphere. Based on current rates of mass loss, and if we assume it has been always the same, the sun could have lost about 0.05% of its mass since formation. That's not enough to solve the paradox, but there is an idea that in the past the sun was losing mass way quicker. This is not a baseless claim. A younger and more active star can generate more stellar wind. And according to some calculations, it could even solve the paradox. But observations of young sun-like stars show that they lose mass more actively only during the first 100 million years of their life, and in reality they lose much less mass than it is necessary to solve the problem. So yes, sun was more massive, but not massive enough. How about we go to Jupiter? There is something that might help us find another option for the solution. Nowadays astronomers are pretty sure that there is an ocean of water under the thick icy crust of Europa, in spite of being very far from the Sun. That's possible due to the mechanism of tidal heating. Europa's orbit is not a perfect circle. Orbiting Jupiter, it experiences varying tidal forces. It basically gets constantly squeezed, which leads to friction, which generates heat. That's also why another Jupiter's moon, Io, experiences the strongest volcanism. So after formation, our moon was several times closer to Earth. In addition, our planet was spinning much faster. In that kind of a system, tidal heating could have played a much bigger role. In this study, scientists created a module to check this idea, combining it with climate models. They concluded that tidal heating can solve the paradox completely, but it could have had some effect. There are also some exotic ideas, for instance, the ones that not only involve the Sun, but the whole universe. Like changing theories of gravity or even proposing a variable gravitational constant. And of course, as it usually goes, there could be multiple effects working at the same time and not just one single solution. The problem is we simply don't know a lot about the conditions of Earth 3-4 billion years ago. An important instrument is climate models. These models get better and better. For instance, in this study from last year, 3D global climate models were used. They successfully recreate warm climate on ancient Earth, though with higher levels of CO2 and methane, but the reasonable ones. So these models require less greenhouse gases. Sure, there are still a lot of unanswered questions, but for instance, the authors of that particular study I've just mentioned believe that the main reason is the greenhouse effect and that the paradox is basically solved. Many will agree with the first statement, but not everybody with the second In one. most cases, the paradox is not considered to be completely solved, and yet there is significant progress. And what's also important is that this problem motivated multiple studies in many scientific fields. Too bad we can't just go back in time and see what our planet was like when life first emerged.